For decades, the American sports car was the laughing stock of the auto industry, especially in Europe where performance and handling were the true measures of what made a good car a great car and what made a great car a supercar. However, in 1989, Chevrolet would change the world's view on American sports cars by introducing at the 1989 Geneva Auto Show the Chevy Corvette ZR1. Considered by many to be America's first supercar, this car would help usher in the Attitude Era of the 90s, the era of extreme. This week, we look at the Chevy Corvette ZR1. This is Virtual Gear. By the time it took to the Geneva International Motor Show in 1989, the Corvette ZR1 had already made its rounds throughout the US and other car shows. However, now it was time to play with the big boys. It was time to show an arena dominated by the likes of Ferrari, BMW, and Mercedes what American engineering could achieve. Much like the Z28, ZL1, and other Z designations, the ZR1 is just a cool sounding Chevrolet regular production option code. First used with the C3 Corvette from 1970 through 1972, the ZR1 package garnered little attention back then, selling only 53 total ZR1s in that time frame. Another thing that really made me excited about reviewing this car was the instrument panel. I love this style of instrument cluster with the colors, the VCR style digits. Also with the amount of leather, the seats hugged its, its riders, uh, the multi-directional controls for both seats, the see-through roof. This was really a cool design. Now let's get back to the history of this car. Fast forward nearly 18 years and the ZR1 package was revitalized and boy did Chevy make it count. In 1986, General Motors acquired Group Lotus and approached them with the idea of building the world's fastest production car based on the C4 Corvette. Lotus went to work with a design to replace the L98 V8 that was in the standard Corvette. GM would dub this the LT5. This 5.7 liter, 350 cubic inch, 375 horsepower, dual overhead cam power plant would allow Group Lotus to help GM achieve their goal. Boasting a zero to 60 time of 4.5 seconds and a zero to 100 in 10.4 seconds, GM did indeed build a fast car. However, that was nothing new for American cars. Could it perform well outside of a straight line? German car parts manufacturer ZF Group designed the six-speed manual transmission that could withstand 425 pounds of torque, well above the Corvette's max torque of 370 pounds. Shifting gears was as smooth as silk, but that's not all. The ZR1's rear end was three inches wider than the standard C4 Corvette to assist with aerodynamics, along with a smooth flare out of the body that started at the front of the doors and traveled all the way to the back. The wider rear also helped provide shelter for the larger rear tires. With larger front disc brakes than the rear, GM also wanted this car to perform well at endurance races, which are normally hell on brake systems. While the suspension of the ZR1 was the same as the stock Corvettes of this era, they did include a thicker rear anti-roll bar to cope with the extra weight and the larger rear end of the ZR1. We'll come back to more on the tech specs of this car. One of the things I want to mention is normally we do 10 laps of a trial run and then we do 10 laps of our timed run. With all the additions and the changes I just mentioned, comparing this to the last three weeks, this car was a dream to drive. We only did one 10 lap run. As you can see here, we ended up with a one minute 27.387 second lap time as our best lap time. 
That was our last lap, and the car just kept getting better and better. In turns three, for example, we would have a lot of difficulties in the past, uh, and actually even turn one. We didn't have much of either one of those turns causing us issues. You can tell the suspension on this car is light years ahead. And granted, we, we're talking 19 years from the Superbird of last week's episode to the Corvette of this week's episode. But still, you can just tell the difference in the suspension of this car, the power of this car. GM really, really put a lot into this car to get it not just fast, but to perform well at a track. And honestly, of all the cars we've done so far, this has been my favorite. This has been probably the easiest car to drive. This has been one of the most fun cars to drive so far. And I'm glad to see it did so well at this track. As a boy who grew up around speed, my mom had all sorts of cars. Uh, you know, a Chevelle, a Camaro, a 427 Impala. She not only had these cars, but she did a lot of street racing or drag racing, sometimes even with me in the front seat. So when this car came out, I was on the cusp of becoming a teenager and I wanted this car. This car was it. It had the look, it had the performance, it had the sound. This was a young man's dream. This was an old man's dream if you grew up in the 60s and had muscle cars. This was a beautiful car. Before we discuss off the track performance, let's send it down to Deacon Dew as he battles the Sophie AI. Thanks Deacon Dew. We are on the in-car headset. First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna start in third. Speaking of gearing, we are back on the stick shift on the rig because this is a manual transmission and it is on the floor. So we will be racing mostly one-handed because of that. And, oh, 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 well, that's not what I wanted to do, but that hap it happened. All right, gotta give me a little bit of room here, guys. Man, I love the Sophie AI. I love the Sophie AI around here. It's very aggressive. This car is fast and stable. I can see why a lot of people consider it America's first quote unquote supercar. It's fast, it's stable. Its brakes aren't the best. I can definitely pick up time here. Yep, yep. All right, we're up to ninth now, starting in 11th. I don't know if we're going to get to, you know, the second to fourth we've normally been getting to. Uh, but we definitely are going to have a better time. And here comes that Shelby. Yep. Flying by me. That thing is fast. Uh, we can get up to about 145, 150 in this car, which is a lot faster. Oh. Brakes on this are not designed to stop this car going 150, which is what I think we just hit. Uh, that's the only... Thing I would say about this car is the brakes are maybe a little underpowered, but the stock brakes that is. We should be able to pick up some time here. Yep. Down to third. We want to try to keep this around 95 in turn one. All right, down to third again. And we're already in sixth. We might have a shot at podium. Come on, oh, that Viper going to race me hard and right here if i'm not careful i can get thrown to the left off that curbing in this car just like i did right there this lamborghini is going to blow me away if i can't pass it here Woo. that lamborghini may pass me Yeah, it's gonna to try to pass me on the left, all right. Uh, the cluster, I love the instrument cluster on this thing. I love the colors, the green, the yellow, red, the VCR-like uh, uh, lettering and numbering. Gives you a lot of information. You know, you can even see your fuel mileage and your instant fuel mileage right there in the middle. I love the fact that the meters for the speedometer and tachometer are there, but you also have digits you know you have the uh, vcr on-screen display the digits right there sorry i'm a little distracted 
so when you max out those meters, you can actually tell where you are, how fast you're going, what your tack, what your RPMs are. I'm trying to shift this thing around 6,000 down to third here. That that turn has been so stable this week. Uh, the only turn that has not been stable has been this curb right here on the end of the S's right there. If you get up on it too much in this car, it will throw you to the left. Oh, we've got a good time here, really good time. We have two cars ahead of us. That's it. Wow. Oh, a little bit of sliding there. <laughs> All right, I think these, oh yeah, these Aston Martins are gonna blow us away on this back straightaway here. Yeah, we're not keeping up with these things. Uh, I don't see anybody really in the rear view. So we should have third place. The question's going to be what kind of time we have. We are gonna shoot for a sub, I believe a sub 440 is our goal. As close to 430 as we can. Oh, whoa, it down, get down to second. Rev it out, rev it out, come on, come on, come on. There we go. Third. All right, yeah, we're not catching those Aston Martins, but whew, this thing is fast. All right, Deacon Do, back to you at the studio to see what our time was. This was a joy to ride. One of my favorite things to drive so far, if not my favorite. Great job, Deacon Do, bringing home a podium in that Corvette. Uh, you are right, your time was much better this week than it has been in previous weeks with a time of 4 minutes, 33 points, we'll call it point two seconds. So great job against the Sophie AI. And as we watch this race in third person, let's go ahead and discuss more of what GM did to make this car what it was. Because it wasn't just on the track that this car would really get a legacy. It was also a great touring car equipped with what was affectionately referred to as the kitty key owners could easily reduce the engine output by 150 horsepower for more leisurely driving but it could enable full performance mode to unleash the beast the suspension like the vanilla c4 of the era was managed by the fx3 selective ride control system with three settings touring sport and performance with each setting having had six levels of shock absorber damping, running the performance mode on anything other than smooth roads could cause your hemorrhoids to flare up. But on the track, when combined with the other additions, it made the ZR1 corner like a dream. However, when the touring mode suspension was paired with the 150 less horsepower engine mode, this car became a fantastic grand touring vehicle. You would be able to take this out on some of the most scenic drives and not have to worry about either fuel economy or a rough ride. Pairing this with the performance and sport modes of this car, this car had a legacy in many ways. Combining all of this, it is very easy to see why many folks consider this America's first supercar. Throughout the 90s, cars would become faster, look sexier, and even perform and handle better. The ZR1 will be finally remembered by car enthusiasts. Sure, the merit of calling the Corvette C4 ZR1 a supercar can be debated. You can't deny, however, that this car changed the world's view on American sports cars in terms of performance, looks, and off-track enjoyment. Without question, the Corvette C4 ZR1 still commands the respect it garnered way back in 1989. It is yet to be seen whether I will ever drive a C4 Corvette in real life. But thanks to Gran Turismo 7, the PlayStation 5, and PSVR 2, I can live vicariously through this game. And this has been a wonderful car to drive. A dream come true of sorts. The only thing better would be if I could someday actually get into a ZR1 from this era. As we wrap up this week's show, first I want to thank you for watching. And if you can, go ahead, like this video, click the subscribe button, and don't forget to ring that bell. You can also follow me over on Twitch at twitch.tv forward slash where I do race live. And finally, 
if you head over to Twitter or X or whatever you want to call it and give me a follow, you can vote on next week's car, which will be an American manufactured car from the 1990s. And until next time, make sure you take care of yourselves and each other and have a blessed day. Thank you.